Um, so that is kind of the before you start make sure you understand all these things um, now I'm actually going to go into what you can expect to um, provide in the application um, since we have a very large um, group of, of people on the workshop today with varying needs I'm not going to go project by project okay we have about 15 project types and there might be one that only applies to one percent of the people um, on the workshop today. So what I've done instead is I've summarized um, the information that will be requested for each project and you can take this um, presentation once it's given to you and you can look at okay I'm requesting this project and I should have prepared information based on um, kind of this information that they're requesting. So that'll make sense more sense once I get into it but I just kind of want to you know, give you expectations of exactly how deep we're going today uh, in terms of the project by project uh, analysis of the application. Um, but again, if the um, if you're not if you don't feel that the depth we go into explanation today is sufficient, please say so in your evaluation so that in future cycles, you know, we can go in as deep as needed um, to make you successful but I hope you know what we cover today is going to give you a good idea of what to expect so as I just mentioned um, there is two ways to know something is required in your application so a require field will be notated with a red asterisk um, as indicated there in the screenshot so if you see that you know you must provide um, a response there if you, um, I had mentioned the templates, so this is just um, a screenshot of some vehicle projects, um, some attachments required for vehicle projects, sorry about that, hit my mouse. Um, as you can see in the supporting text, it has, it's an ODOT template. So if you were a vehicle applicant, um, and this does not apply to the large urban um, providers who are procuring their own vehicles, um, but if you are someone that would be requesting a vehicle off of our state term contract, uh, you would have to complete a vehicle worksheet that we've provided, and that is an ODOT template. So you would know, okay, I need to do a vehicle cost worksheet for this vehicle, and it's an ODOT template. I need to go to the related document section of the ODOT website, pull up that template and complete it, and then upload it. So hopefully that makes sense. If you do not see ODOT template in that supporting text, then that means that that is a um, document that you would produce and provide locally. So, you know, like your letters of support. Obviously, we don't have a template for that. Um, ridership numbers, things like that. You're not going to see that supporting text there. That lets you know you produce it and supply it. Um, so this is just an overview of the application sections. Now again, we have a mixed bag of applicants here with us today. We have some urban transit providers who may only be um, getting state funds or federal flex funds, and then we have some rural transit providers who, you know, actually do get their federal funding through ODOT. So based on who you are it will depend on what sections you ultimately see so some of these sections that you see may actually not apply to you and i am going to um, try to make those distinctions as i go through the presentation today just so you know okay this doesn't apply to me or it does um, first and foremost is applicant information so this is a section that everyone's going to um, complete and this is a really crucial section because it actually determines what you do see moving throughout the application so for example in the applicant information we ask you you know where are you operating out of and if you say you're in urban public transit you're not going to see you know the system profile the technical assistance request sections those are going to be hidden so you don't even have to you know interact with it because it doesn't apply to you um, so you know making sure that this section is filled out correctly is going to be really important that you didn't accidentally select a, a different answer than you intended um, because it really does kind of dictate uh, the rest of the application and what you're going to see um, so applicant information is very general technical capacity um, this is only going to apply apply to rural transit providers. This is where we're really asking um, about 
like your financial capacity and things like that. Um, and since urban transit systems receive funding directly from FTA and are overseen by FTA, uh, we never dive too deep uh, in that because they review you and obviously um, know whether or not you have the capacity to administer their funds. Um, ADA equivalent service assessment, so we want to make sure that you are um, providing service that meets ADA requirements. System profile is a rural transit um, section, and that is where we're going to get more information about your fare structure, um, the type of system you are in terms of what service you provide, um, et cetera, et cetera. Project information is going to apply to everyone. This is where you are going to actually indicate uh, what projects are going to be included in your application. So you will make sure to select all projects here and that will ultimately dictate what sections you see. So if you only select operating and vehicles, you will only see an operating project section and a vehicle project section. You will not see any of the other projects. So double check this, make sure every project that you're intending to apply for is represented here. Um, um, because otherwise you will not see the sections and then ultimately will not be able to apply. Project planning efforts. Uh, this is the section where we will ask more questions about the uh, coordinated planning process, transportation development plan, um, STIP and TIP, uh, projects so we have one section um, that speaks to those efforts so that way it's just one effort of you referencing those documents all at once and being able to um, answer the questions for all your projects. Technical assistance request is new to the application and I will go into that uh, in a dedicated slide and it is for uh, rural transit systems only. And then the attachment section applies to everyone. This is also logic driven like most of the application. So you will only see the attachments here that you were required to submit based on who you are and what you're applying for. Um, so. We're very excited about uh, the application and it being so logic driven because it really takes the guesswork, guesswork sorry, uh, out of it for you in terms of what do they want me to provide, um, what's appropriate for what I'm doing. The logic will, will kind of make that very clear for you. It's basically a customized application by applicant. Um, so this is just like an expanded explanation of the type of information that we are going to be requesting from you. Um, so while you're not actually looking at the application today because it hasn't been published, again, you can reference this um, presentation and know ahead of time what information you're going to be expecting provide um, because and then start gathering that information so that once the application is published you know you have everything ready and it's really just at that point entering it into the application so we're going to ask for your legal name address county served agency type service area um, service area that's a tough one so you'll have service area questions in terms of each project will ask you um, where are you serving where what area is this project serving and that's a much more specific service area as like you know the city of Greenville or this route you know you get a lot more detail by project the application information the service area actually is asking you are you in a rural area or an urban area and so this is where you're going to run into problems right um, this is why those two applications are required because you can only select one um, so if you are going to be applying for projects in both areas, that's why those two separate applications are ultimately going to be required because you must indicate one. Um, your taxpayer number, DUNS number, and contact information. So contact information is broken down into four contacts um, and this is just because there are some uh, transit systems that do have multiple people, pe sorry I am speaking over myself today, um, there are some transit systems that have multiple people involved in uh, delivering the projects and we want to make sure on our end that we know who's appropriate to contact. There will be an option though um, where if you fill out the, pro the program contact will be required and that is who will receive the confirmation email that the application has been submitted. Um, but then you'll have the option for fiscal and administrative contact to just select that this is the same as the program contact because some 
some people do have smaller operations and they are kind of a one-man shop and you don't have to you know duplicate that effort so you do have that option to say it's the same as the program contact or define uh, separate people but the authorized official um, has to be indicated because that person is who ultimately is represented in the authorizing resolution as being able to uh, transmit grants, execute contracts, submit invoices, etc. Um, for the ODOT Office of Transit programs. So even if it is the same as the program contact, that's fine, but we want you to actually take the time to fill that out and confirm who the authorized official is. So I do want to, this is a lot of words, um, but it's really just for you to be able to access later. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I'm not sure who's aware of this, but the federal government is actually transitioning away from the Dunn's number, and this is effective in just a few weeks. Um, so as of April 4th. So, you know, you need to go into SAM and actually do this update if you haven't already. And so I did want to take a moment to point that out and also provide you with the steps of what you need to do to make sure that your SAM is active and everything is updated um, prior to the application being due because it is it is ultimately required for us to be able to go into contract with you on any of these projects. And we do um, require you to upload SAM verification with your application. So I wanna go ahead and make you guys aware of this right now in case you do have some work um, to do on this front. Um, this slide will be in the presentation so you can come back and reference this if you are concerned um, that things aren't updated on your end. And like I said, I've provided the steps for you to go through um, to verify this information. Um, service information. So this again is uh, rural transit related, um, but we will ask you for your if, what your grantee designation is. Are you a direct grantee? Are you a designated grantee? You'll be asked to provide your um, designated grantee letter. Uh, we ask you if you have a third-party service provider and all for all of that information to so make sure you have that handy. We ask you about your fare structure and things like that. So, you know, just make sure that you have that readily accessible once you're ready to sit down and do the application. We also ask about your technical capacity. Um, we have tried to streamline our processes internally in terms of not requesting policies and procedures through the application and then through, you know, our technical assistance review process, etc. So we have been utilizing the important documents module of Black Hat to collect your policies and procedures, but we do have a, some brief questions about just asking you if you do have these things implemented because that will serve as our um, check to make sure that if you did indicate you had the policies and procedures we can then check the importance documents module to make sure that you have have them uploaded and if there is any kind of disconnect there we can then reach out to you and say hey you indicated you had this but we don't have any record of it you need to upload it right and then organizational structure, um, what kind of training your staff gets as it relates to our programs, and then the 2 CFR 200 financial requirements. I do want to quickly call out 2 CFR 200. Again, this only applies to people who will ultimately receive our federal funds um, through Section 5311 um, or 5310, but um, I've provided the link to the, the website that actually has all the guidance documents. There are five of them, not all of them apply to everyone, um, but it has all the information about how you kind of understand what applies to me, what I'm expected to submit. Um, so I've included that link there for you so you can go there. And again, it's only required for mobility management, preventive maintenance, and operating applicants. So those uh, projects that are reimbursement based and we're not gathering all of that documentation up front in terms of exactly what you're invoicing and, and exactly how those numbers were generated, um, this is those are high risk projects for us. So we want to make sure up front that you have the financial capacity um, to compliantly administer those funds locally. So that way, you know, our risk goes down in terms of mismanagement of the funds, et cetera. 